Good morning. Good morning. morning. Delighted to be here and have spent the last several days with this group. And again, uh, kudos to uh, Abby the Amazing and, uh, and to Alexander the Great, I guess we would call him, so Alexander as well. So it's really, uh, really great to be here. One of the other boards I serve on is on Fresh Pet. And I'm also the chair of the comp committee, which means Billy had to come. Uh, so these things kind of work out pretty well. You've had some wonderful speeches. People, I, you know, James Ree and, uh, and, and Synth was just you know, fabulous, just one after the other. Uh, very inspirational. People standing ovations when it's done. Uh, this is not going to be like that. All right, no more inspiration. <laughs> this is about information, about specific actions uh, that we've taken here at Fresh Pet, led by, by Billy and his team, uh, to really create a, a very special business that I think we're all really proud of. I'll kind of start us off, I want to get a sense of where you all are on the purpose journey. So I run CCP, we're like a sister organization to Conscious Capital, but at, with bigger companies. So 72 of the Fortune 100 are part of our group, uh, about 230 companies around the globe. So big companies trying now to change their companies to do what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. All right? so, and the part of the notion, it's kind of worry. So how many people understand the, kind of the why, the value of being purpose-driven Conscious Capitals? That's mm-hmm. kind of, you get that, right? That's good. How many understand what that means? Eh, kind of right, okay. That sort of upper depth, and we'll kind of go through that a little bit by thinking about stakeholders mm-hmm. and how we might engage those, and how many people get the how. How do we make it happen? Right? That's kind of the challenge. I think Billy will give a great example of how Fresh Pet is scaling purpose in the, in this case, happens to be in the public markets. Because when we do look back 100 years, It'll be, we look back and people who kind of changed the game would be like Henry Ford and what he did. He did some bad stuff, but <laughs> good stuff he did in raising wages for his employees so they could afford the cars. Mm-hmm. Right. People who drove scale at that time can really make an impact and a difference. And hopefully we'll give you some tips, some ideas about what that looks like. Does that kind of work for everybody? Okay, good, good. Um, last quick question is trust. All right, now I'm going to ask you, if, if you kind of agree with what I say, put your hand this way. You pretty much agree this way. Mm-hmm. If you really love what I'm saying, this way. Right? I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions on trust. And if you're really there, you can stand up on this. Yeah. All right? So how many people here trust the media? All right, there we go. There uh, obviously from an ad. Right, there we go. That's fine. Have to support the group. Mm-hmm. And this, this is not a statement about any particular state or, uh, we heard about Alabama, Texas, or the federal government. How many people trust government? A little bit, okay, come with some, send some stuff. How many people here trust nonprofits, like Conscious Capital, CSP? Amazing, right? And by the way, I'll we'll come back to these. How many people trust business? Yeah, and the data you are sharing is very consistent with Richard Edelman, who's on our board at CCP, Edelman Trust Barometer, seen around the U.S. and around the globe. How many people here trust the company in which they're working? Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, think about that. Think about what that means, right? And yes, exactly, exactly. Even if it's selling parking lot, parking spaces, right? Exactly. Yeah. And how many people here trust their dogs, right? <laughs> incredible. You're going to hear a lot about dogs and pets and those today, but it is really incredible, right? When you think about a, a dog, you put your dog, if you weren't going out and put your dog in the garage for an hour, lock them in there and stuff like that, you came back. That dog's going to come and you know, hug you and you know, tail to mini wagon. You put your spouse or a kid in there, you're either divorced or, or you're going to jail, right? I mean, it's, so what, what trust really means, that's important as we think about this whole movement, is what we do is matters and our consciousness, as we heard yesterday, but also how other people perceive this. Um, and I think Fresh Pet will be a good example of a company that's on that journey to really make that happen. All right, so Billy, why are you at Fresh Pet? Yeah. I actually joined Fresh Pet five years ago. Um, the company was founded in 2005, so I joined a decade in. And many of you probably haven't heard of Fresh Pet, and at the time, even fewer people heard of Fresh Pet. But what I'd seen about Fresh Pet convinced me that it was in the business of changing an industry and in changing the way people fed their pets. And to me, that was a very motivating mission, and it's what drew me there. And I, at the time, had a lot of other opportunities I could have pursued. But that was a very motivating mission for me. And I saw that as a, a very inspiring career opportunity. And also to work with a great board. And right? a great yeah, board, okay. a so, fabulous board. Right. So, uh, and I had been about a few years earlier as we took the company public and brought Billy in, which has yeah. been, uh, been great. Um, you get to work with founders. How many people here are founders of their businesses? 
Okay, okay. How is that? It's the hardest part of the job. Um, you know, the, the founders, I have two of the three founders of Fresh Pet are still with the company. The, the third one left a long time ago, 2011. Uh, so the two of the three are there. And I have this little note on my wall in my office, and it has just, it has two words written on it. It's, um, it's one of them is disruptive. Um, and you sit there and most people would perceive that to be a negative, but the reality is if you're talking about the world of innovation, disruptive is an incredibly positive term. That's the, how you create you know, real value. And the, uh, the other one is uh, unrealistic or in the concept of unrealistic expectations. And I look at this and I think, you know, that's or unreasonable would be the other way to look at it. And I look at that and I think that's what these guys are every single day. And my job is to take unrealistic or unreasonable and disruptive people and get the virtue out of that instead of the vice. And if I can do that every single day, we will get the greatest value creation, the greatest innovation for our organization uh, and the benefit for our stakeholders. But I have to do it in a way that gets the value without getting the vice. And that's, that's a real challenge. And those of you who are founders, I love you. I think you create an enormous amount of value but you're hard. You're really hard to work with, really hard to work with. And there are stages where businesses, the founders, can still play an enormously powerful role. Yes. Um, Scott Morris, who's the founder, president of the group, involved every day, and he is, at first it was a little strange when Billy came, but after a while it was like, thank goodness Billy takes care of that stuff, you know, right. dealing with investors, dealing with all those others, so I can continue to be the innovator. And sometimes striking that right balance is yeah. really going to be critical in a, in a successful organization and company. It's interesting because uh, I always tease uh, Scott that if you read Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs and everywhere you see the name Steve Jobs, you replace it with Scott Morris and everywhere you see computers, replace it with pet food. It's basically the same exact same book. And I always say to him, I said, do you want to be the Steve Jobs that got fired the first time or do you want to be the Steve Jobs who changed the world the second time? Because the second time Steve Jobs figured out how to be enormously successful. And in part, it's because he found, you know, he found Tim Cook, who became his, side, his partner, who brought a lot of the scaling capability and the systems and structure and process that became invisible to everybody else because the innovation stood out. But it was absolutely essential for Apple to achieve their success. So FreshPet was founded as a purpose company. It has talked about the so. purpose. Maybe, Billy, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And also how it's not just words, but how it's embedded into the enterprise. Yeah, it's, we, we talk about pets, people, planet. Um, we actually have trademarked pets, people, planet in the concept of uh, the pet space. And that is what, those are the stakeholders who we consider in every single decision that we make. So we think about how this might, uh, every decision, how will this enhance the lives of the pets that we serve? The people, and our definition of people, starts at its very core with our employee base. It broadens out to the pet parents, and from the pet parents it goes out into the broader community that we serve, and then the planet. Um, one of the things that we often, often talk about is, as a young company, and something that is scaling very quickly, we have license to build in some of the costs or the decisions or processes that enable those things, because if you try to add them back in later on, it gets really hard because somebody will look at them like it's an added cost. So for example, our employees walk home with a bag of Fresh Pet every day. We have coolers out there, just walk out, take food. We feed our employees you know, every day. We feed them you know, whatever meals they need. We have food there that feeds our employees every day. Uh, that's not typical in industrial America uh, these days. And when I'm talking about our feeding our employees, I'm really talking about the manufacturing employees, the people who operate in our uh, offices. It's distinctly different than the people who work in an office, as a, you know, people who work in a plant. Those folks we oftentimes think of as a different group of people, but that's the group that we talk about, that's the group that we focus on is those folks. And so we've built into our decision-making process, for example, we use wind power. We use wind power to run our fresh pet kitchens. Uh, that was built into the cost structure from the get-go. So we buy wind power credits every year, and that fund or fuels our, our facilities. And that's built into every single decision that we make. And so we are, we're down this journey and keep looking for more ways to add, add to that. And our success enables us to add even more. You know, at CECP, we work with a lot of big companies who often were founded as purpose-driven. You know, then they get into the public markets and it gets all kind of messed up. So now the challenge is how do you re redirect them 
One of the things we've done is we create a uh, forum we call it the CEO Investor Forum, where companies literally will share their long-term sustainable business plan with everybody. Everything is done FD compliant, it's with investors, all stakeholders, you can find them all. We've had about 60 companies, north of three trillion of, of market cap who've shared their long-term plans. Most recently, the biopharma industry, CEOs of, anybody heard of Moderna, <laughs> Pfizer, J&J, &J, sharing not only what they've done on the vaccine and essentially helping to save the world, but what comes down the road. And what we talk about, it all starts out with talk about your corporate purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, we then talk about how they engage with their various stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So that may be a model we can use here, Billy, to think about what you're doing and that purpose and how do you kind of connect it? Because I didn't see a lot of hands go way up on how, mm -hmm. right? Everybody gets the why, this makes sense. The what, yeah. But if you think around it around those stakeholders that Billy mentioned, it's a pretty cool framework mm -hmm. and how they're all connected yeah. and need to be really integrated. Let's, um, so, you're growing. Mm -hmm. Fresh Pet's growing well. Um, this year, what, what can we say here on the numbers? It's public company. We, so. we, we gave, we've guided this year to 40% year-on-year growth to $445 million in net sales for the year that ends in December. Uh, and we have accelerated our growth rate every year for the last five years. And you start with, you'll have a five-year plan that right. has been publicly yes. shown. Right. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we do to engage the stakeholders is we laid out in 2000, in beginning of 2017, we gave our stakeholders a goal for 2020. Unlike many public companies, which try to constrain themselves to a sort of an algorithm of, we'll grow you know, X percent each year on the top line and X percent each year on the bottom line, we're very much more sort of moonshot uh, focused. We, we're changing the world, and you don't change the world by thinking incrementally. You change the world by thinking in big leaps. And so we set a 2020 target. And the 2020 target we set, we were a relatively small company when we set the target, we completed a year of $115 million in its sales, and we said in three and a half years, we were going to be a $300 million company. When we beat that in 2020, we set a new target for 2025, and we said at the time that we would be a $1 billion company in 2025. A year later, when we were running so far ahead, we revised that up to a $1.25 billion uh, target. But again, it's not an algorithm of an annual performance, it's moonshot. It's how do you get to this long-term target, and then how do you align all your decision-making, all your resources, all the stakeholders against the long-term target, rather than against this sort of tight algorithm of this year we'll do this, or this quarter we'll do this. Right. And our compensation plan is built on that same target, right. that same five-year perspective, rather than a quarter-to-quarter -quarter kind of a mindset. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, really to help people align those incentives with all the top executives in the whole company on the same basic um, compensation system. Yeah, and it's interesting because we, we also started with the goal is, I, I expressed it in terms of dollars, and that's a common metric that a lot of people think of, but the reality is we expressed it in terms of households. If your mission is to change the way people nourish their pets, then the metric of that is not dollars. The metric for that is how many people are doing that. And so we had, at the time we set the target that we have today, we had 3 million households who are doing that. Uh, we're up to 4.1 million households today. Our target is to be in 11 million households by 2025. And everything flows from that. So if we achieve that mission of changing the way people nourish their pets in 11 million households, that will deliver all the other metrics beneath that, the net sales, the, the profitability, all the other elements that our other stakeholders are interested in but it really starts with what is the mission and how do you get to that mission. Terrific. So now let's kind of think about across the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to grow, you need capital, mm -hmm. and therefore you need investors to make that happen. Yeah. And sometimes people want to grow. You know, the old saying is everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if you want to grow, you're going to have to engage other people's money to really grow at the kind of yeah. rate in that. So if you kind of look at that, how do you look at that investors is part of key uh, key stakeholders. And we'll go yeah. through the, the five stakeholders that the Business Roundtable talked about, right? Yeah. Each of those will go investors, we'll talk about community, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously as a publicly traded company, and when, when, when I started, we had a private equity backer who still owned a little more than 20% of the stock. They have since sold their shares. So we literally are, you know, pure public company with a shareholder base that looks like all your biggest uh, uh, public companies. Uh, we went from a company that had a market cap of $280 million five years ago to we have a market cap today of about $6.5 billion. Uh, so it's a tremendous success, and all the people who were with us back then have done incredibly well, and they feel very good. I mean, the stock was trading at $9 when we launched our current strategy. Yesterday, it closed at about $145. So in five years, a lot of people feel very, very good about what we did. But it's not just what we did, but it's also how we did it. 
we view ourselves as being very focused on the long term. And if you want to be focused on the long term, you have to nurture shareholders who are also interested in the long term. You can't just say, we're going to do what we're going to go do and let the market do what it wants to do. When I started, we had 20% of our shares were shorted. Uh, today, we have less than 1% of our shares are shorted. And part of the way we've done that is, you know, my theory is that shorts live in information gaps. So we squeeze out the information gaps by providing the most data you could possibly provide. Every quarter, we put out 50-page decks that are data-laden, that are designed to cater to the needs of the longest-term shareholders, the people who want to buy your stock and own it for five years and not worry that something is going to happen along the way, at a milestone along the way. They want to have the ultimate in confidence that they're buying something that has really solid underpinnings. So we cater everything that we do from an investor relations perspective to meet the needs of those investors and put them in an advantaged position versus the guy who wants to trade in and out of your stock on quarterly news. And if we can do that well, we, we ultimately get to a place where the interests of our shareholders are now aligned with our mission, our longer term mission, my compensation, the compensation of our leadership team, and the interests of all of our stakeholders. And so we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about who are those people, how do we reach them, what information they need, how do we give the level of transparency that makes them feel comfortable owning something for five years? And, uh, and that's a critical part of our, our, of our business strategy. And so many companies, when they go public, and Kip Tindall and I have talked about this, kind of think about the market as being monolithic. Mm -hmm. that there's, that's the market's investors. Investors are like, you know, they're not always people, but they're always like other people. You know, some are shorts. They bet against the stock. Mm -hmm. They expect you to fail. And they'll, in fact, put out news to try to make you fail. Others are trading on a daily basis. Some, as Billy says, quarterly. On up to pension and index funds, index funds are going to hold you forever. Mm -hmm. right? They're never going to trade you. They'll vote the proxy if they don't like where you're headed, if you're not being a good citizen and things like that. So thinking about those different segments are really critical because you kind of get the shareholders you deserve yeah, or exactly. you talk to. Yeah. And uh, a lot of companies just talk about short-term stuff, and you get a lot of short-term people. And if you're going to be purpose-driven, you got to line up the, the, yeah. the, the group there. You also have to engage with those folks. You have to identify who are those shareholders who have shared values, who are interested in the things that you're interested in, and then you go out and you meet their needs. I spend an enormous amount of time with these shareholders so that they know they have an opportunity to have a voice with us and express their interest to ask their questions. A really good example, and it kind of bridges into another topic that Daryl and I would like to talk about, but we announced a new labor strategy about two months ago that is raising the wages that we're paying to our employees very significantly and making a very significant investment in the training and development of our employees. We got applauded by our shareholders. Our shareholders thought this was the best thing in the world because they're focused on the long term. They want us to be the kind of company that's going to be here five years from now, not the company who's scraping by to make it quarter to quarter and views every dollar we pay an employee as a dollar that's not in their pocket. That's not the shareholders that we've got. So when we announced this, we had an unbelievable outpouring of support from the shareholders because we had cultivated shareholders who shared our values and shared our mission. But that took multiple years to get to that point. We couldn't have just done that out of the blue. You have to cultivate the right shareholder base in order to get to that, that point. So as you think about stakeholders, investors, a couple hundred, you know, six, nine dollars a share to 145, yep. reasonably happy, engaged for the long term, more and more interested in things like environmental, social governance. Yep. How about the community? How, yeah. where does, how does that play relative to the purpose? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Daryl and I just spent the day on Monday. Uh, we're, we're building our next Fresh Pet kitchen. So we make all of our products in kitchens, and we have two of them today, one in Bethlehem, or two, both of them on a campus in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. But we're growing so fast, we need another facility. And so uh, we are putting a facility in Ennis, Texas, which is about 45 minutes south of Dallas. So we spent the day touring the construction site that's there. And we met with the mayor and the city manager while we were there, and we walked the site with them. And it's really fascinating because the, one of the reasons that we chose Ennis, Texas, is because it's a town, while it's a, you know, out, just outside the Dallas Metroplex, it's a town with a vision. They have a clear sense for where they want to go. They have a long-term plan. They're building amenities for their citizens. They have built a new high school. They, built a, they own a hospital in town. They're building out entertainment venues, parks, and whatnot. But they're also putting in good infrastructure to support people like us. So the water systems, the sewer systems, the utilities, and whatnot. 
And so we like engaging with people who are really interested in building out an ecosystem that works for everybody, that's working for the citizens of the community, it's working for the industry in the community, and I can't tell you enough about how well they've done that there. And that's what drew us there, because we did a national site selection. We looked at a lot of places that we could have gone, but we chose to go there because we thought that they were like-minded. They thought of all the things that we did. I literally spent time talking to them about water. They have a very good water supply there, you know, a very big uh, uh, reservoir that, that more than would meet our needs. But we're really focused on recycling and reusing the water that we use. So while we use a fairly significant amount of water, we are investing very heavily in the recycling and reusing. Same thing with the utility grid there. We expect to be energy independent by the time we finish co the construction of that site between solar and, uh, and um, uh, cogeneration. We could be fully independent, and they love that because it means the utility infrastructure that they've built for this community is available to support a much broader range of needs rather than having to continue to spend money on that. We're spending on it to make ourselves energy independent. But we try to do that across the broad networks, and I would give one example of just on a small scale, one of the things that we did that demonstrates the innovation in the middle of COVID. Right when COVID hit, you know, we're in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We have a workforce that is about 40% Hispanic, and uh, as COVID hit, uh, we realized that a lot of family-owned restaurants were being shut down because they didn't have drive-throughs. They didn't have the infrastructure to do, you know, ordering online and do pickup or takeout uh, to keep themselves in business. At the same time, it is essential business. We were able to keep operating. And so our employees were coming to work, theoretically taking whatever risks their family perceived them to be taking, and going home, the families had the kids at home because the schools were closed, and so people are cooped up at home, and we realized that everybody needed a break. So we did every Friday, we went out and we bought thousands and thousands of dollars of gift cards from local family-owned restaurants in the communities where our, our employees lived, and these gift cards provided a ready supply of cash to these restaurants that might have otherwise gone out of business, and we turned around and we gave them to all of our employees every Friday, so that they could, each one of them got a $50 gift card to go get a meal at a restaurant, a takeout meal from a restaurant in their neighborhood. So we supported the neighborhoods they live in, supported the family, supported the business. Yes, it cost us you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to keep doing that over the span of the summer and into the fall, but that's small potatoes. In the grand scheme of things, we helped save some family businesses and we made our employees' lives better. Those are the kinds of things that we do. So we talked about investors, important yeah. to have them link because they help provide the capital to grow, about communities because that's the infrastructure, the ecosystem which you're operating. How about the suppliers? How yeah. do you think about suppliers as you go at those? You know, some of the time is how do you beat them down for the lowest price, yeah. but how, how does Fresh Pet think about engaging with them in a purposeful way? Yeah, it's interesting. So first of all, we are almost entirely domestically supplied. The only things we don't get domestically are the few things that are not available domestically. Um, and we are very focused on local. The vast majority of our stuff comes from within 75 miles of our, of our manufacturing facilities. And that's part of you know, building out the infrastructure and the support for the business. But then we have a sit down with every one of the suppliers and we talk to them about where it is we're trying to go, especially in the context of putting out an ESG report where you know, as a public company, we have a lot of shareholders who are expecting us to report all of our uh, ESG data for scope one, scope two, and scope three. And scope three includes all those suppliers upstream from us who are engaged in the you know, raising of chickens and the raising of cows and uh, you know, production of vegetables. And so we have to engage all of them. And so we're very selective about the partners we've chosen and setting clear expectations for what they're gonna do. I will tell you, one of the areas that we're gonna struggle is we're this big in the poultry supply chain. We buy an enormous amount of chicken. And so our ability for us to influence the way in which people raise their chickens in this country is limited. You know, we don't buy the entire chicken, we only buy part of the chicken, so we're dependent upon somebody else buying the other part of the chicken. And so we can't set all the rules, but we're working really, really hard to try to find a way to make it so it's less agricult agriculturally intensive, less water intensive, uh, it's much more humane conditions for the animals, and get suppliers who are thinking that way. In addition to that, we're also using innovation. We launched a product this, this uh, about a month ago we call Spring and Sprout, which is a vegetarian uh, pet food. So it has uh, the proteins that are coming from vegetables as well as um, it also comes from egg. We use egg, which is a very complete balanced protein to provide vegetarian pet food. And it's, a, it's the first fresh refrigerated uh, vegetarian pet food and we'll see how it goes. 
but it's again an interest of thinking about our supply chain, how do we reduce the environmental impact in our supply chain, and at the same time meet the needs of our consumers who are very interested in that, who are very concerned about animal welfare, treatment of the animals, and also the environmental impact that we have as a company. So let's talk to the next stakeholder is consumers, and we'll yeah. finish up with employees, but yeah. consumers, how do you view the consumer base? You got, I guess a couple of them, right? You got the people who buy and then the, the favorite part, part of the family who actually eats the yeah. product. Yeah, well, we love our pets. Um, I always think about, I didn't take the job at Fresh Pet until I had served my dog Fresh Pet, and my dog said, I don't want to eat this kibble stuff anymore. She literally, after we tried some of the Fresh Pet, my wife is very frugal and had this bag of dry kibble that she was not going to throw away. So she tried to put it in the bowl, and our dog went over, picked up the kibble, and spit it on the floor, and said, I've tasted the good stuff. I am not going back. And so uh, we, there, there are, that's our consumer base, and that's who we care the most about. Um, but obviously the relationship, we think about the relationship between the pet parent and the pet, and it is, in essence, one of the strongest, most connected relationships you can possibly have. Uh, actually, one of the Wall Street analysts who covers us just did an, a survey or did a study where he documented that pets provide virtually every benefit you could expect from having a kid for $10,000 less per year. So, um, you know, it's a pretty rational decision to, to delay having children and just get a dog. Um, but we think about them, we think about them as, a, as really critical stakeholders, and we work on everything we do, we think about it in the context of what makes their lives better. 82% of pet parents will tell us that they notice a physical difference in the health of their dog when they feed them fresh pet. 20% of the fresh pet users that we have today are people who took up, who are using us because their other, the dog they had before that had a health problem late in life. They wouldn't eat, the, had a skin problem, they couldn't tolerate the food, their, their coat looked bad, and they were panicked. They looked for anything they could find to feed their pet, and they ultimately found fresh pet, and they tell us, and they write us letters and emails, and they tell us, my dog is like a puppy again. You gave me two more years with my dog. And when that dog ultimately passes away, they start their next dog on Fresh Pet. And that's because they recognize the benefits that, that, of the product. But we think about that as the, the most critical stakeholder. And what's really interesting, and you talk about you know, your values only mean you know, something when you have to pay for them or whatever you paid for them. We're struggling to keep up with demand. Um, we've been building capacity at an incredibly rapid rate, COVID, Putting, sending people out for testing and quarantine certainly constrained our ability to keep up with our demand over the last year. And we had consumers who were getting incredibly mad because they go to the store once, twice, three times, and our fridges were out of stock. They couldn't find Fresh Pet. They go to a second store, a third store, they couldn't find it. And they were sending us these nasty emails that said, hey, listen, are you guys going out of business? Like, what's the story? I can't find it, and my dog lives for your stuff. I cannot feed them anything else. They will not eat the kibble that I put in the bowl. They know there's good stuff out there somewhere. And so we started having Scott, our co-founder, write letters to people and post them on social media that explain to them, we're doing everything we can, we're running the kitchens 24 hours a day, but one thing we will not do is we will not compromise on the safety of our employees. So when we have to send people home for testing or a quarantine because of COVID, and that means we have to shut down our production line and we can't put food in the fridge, we understand we, want, we have an important obligation to you, but our number one obligation is keep our employees safe. And so we will not compromise that. We got thousands of testimonials from consumers on social media telling us, you're exactly the kind of company that I want to buy products from. We can wait. We'll make it through. Do the right things by your employees. Again, when you cultivate the right employee or the right customer base, the people who share your values, when you make a decision that is consistent with your values, you get support, just like it is with our shareholders. So you have to work really diligently, and you can't take them for granted. You have to communicate with them aggressively. But when you do that, you ultimately can get the kind of support that you need. Well, and we'll, well, let's finish with the, yeah. you know, another of the stakeholders, which would be the employee base, yeah. right? Because it doesn't happen without them. We've talked about investors, community. You've talked about uh, the consumer base, suppliers. Uh, employees, what, what makes Fresh Pet special? How does the purpose come out with the, the employee base? Yeah, I mean, we live it. We, tr we, we live the values that we communicate to our employees every day. And again, nothing tells that like how you carry yourselves during the pandemic because, you know, that's where, you know, you're, you're put to the test. And I, I must tell you, I personally get um, a little irritated when I hear companies saying, when are we going to go back to work? When are we going to go back to work? And I keep reminding them that 90% of the workforce in America never stopped working. 
they were going to work in manufacturing facilities and in you know uh, in any Probably. kind of, any kind of uh, industrial operation. They never stopped working, and so the narrative almost acts as if they don't exist. And so we put an enormous amount of focus on them and their life and what they're doing. And so we did all the same things that everybody else did to keep people safe. We were a very fast follower. We were innovative, but really we were fast followers. We also did everything you, you, we could to compensate our employees very well. But it also comes down to the human touch. Since the pandemic started, I no longer go to work in our headquarters. I go to work in our Fresh Pet kitchens every single day. And I arrive at work at 4.45 in the morning so that I can see the night crew before they leave and meet the day crew while they're coming in so they know that I'm taking the same risks that they are. If it's safe enough for me, it's safe enough for them. And that is a very important message because that personal connection is the way in which you live the values of your company. And then you understand what the challenges are they're facing. You understand what the issues are, and we adapt to that. And we, I think, have done a remarkably good job. We lost a very senior employee to COVID at the very beginning of COVID. It was tragic. It was devastating to our organization but it also galvanized the organization around the need to keep everybody safe. And I think our employees appreciated that. We also communicated to their families. We also recognized they were stakeholders. So we sent stuff home to the families. We had uh, the chief medical officer, former chief medical officer of the USDA, hosted calls for our employees' families to answer questions about how to keep people safe from COVID. All those kinds of things, we used them as stakeholders and viewed them as, you're sending a family member to work. We want you to know what we're doing to keep them safe. And we also want you to know that we'll do anything we can to keep you safe, because if you're safe, our employee comes to work not worrying. Right. And I will say that Billy's uh, daily, weekly updates on COVID are the best set, uh, summary of everything that's sort of out there, yeah. which he sends to all the employees throughout the group. Every employee at Fresh Pay, after they're there for six months, uh, is a shareholder. So they're all part of that whole piece. And Billy, just to kind of wrap up, I think we're, we're, we're at time now. Yeah. Um, also, a couple of weeks ago, probably one of the proudest moments I've been associated with that was you mentioned the employee who, who passed away very early on mm -hmm. um, you know, from, from COVID, you know, when, when we were all wondering you know, what was this thing, what was it about. But really, it was a great honor yeah. as you uh, talked about that and uh, dedicated. So. Yeah, we, we were very focused on training of our team. And the person who passed away had been our head of HR. And uh, we dedicated our learning center in his honor. And it was interesting, his uh, children came to this. We invited them. They flew in from out of town. Um, and there had never been a funeral for him. And so we did a dedication of the uh, session, but, or the center for him, um, but it was really, it served for them as their real way in which they could uh, recognize that they had, you know, their father had passed away, and it was served as the, basically the funeral for him. And it re but what's interesting was, as heartwarming as it was for the family, it was really good for our employees. It gave them a sense that we really cared, it gave them a sense that values are values. We live them every day. It also told them that, you know, we're now at a point where I think the daylight is, the sun is rising and the future is here. We're now to the point where we can start putting some of this stuff behind us and bring some of those things to an end and focus on the future. We have vaccines. We now have oral antivirals coming. Um, we've demonstrated an ability to keep people safe uh, for a long time. And so I think it really gave people a sense that there's a, you know, the uh, sun is rising uh, on the uh, horizon and, and the future is very, very bright. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Sear, CEO of Fresh Pet. An example of, uh, of purpose at scale. Yeah. Thank Great you, Billy. You. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.